less, so this is going to be my five minute pitch or, or less, that we not use certain words. As you've seen, I'm, I'm a bit uh, maternal sometimes when I put these rules down. Yesterday saying, you have to dance, and I know no one really obeyed except my <laughs> daughter and her friend. Um, so can we not use, for example, words like picking winners or crowding out? Let's just describe what we're doing, okay? And then after we're describing what we're doing, and by we I mean you, because today we're mainly hearing from people who are working within public and private sector organizations, um, let's not allow anyone to start off by saying, well, we're not picking winners, but we're doing this, or, and, and we're not crowding out, but we're doing that, right? Those terms, one of the whole points of today, and in fact of the whole three days, is they weren't, you know, they're not actually very useful. Um, let me just quickly say why crowding out isn't useful. Crowding out is actually more useful really just talking about kind of the business cycle, right? When you have, if and when you have underutilized capacity, of which we know, for example, today we have a lot of, even if you end up just kind of dicking ditches and filling them up again, which is what Keynes, of course, said back in the 1930s, you might get a multiplier effect which actually increases GDP, it increases the supply of total savings, which then can be used by both the private and the public sector, so you're sort of crowding in. Um, now, I don't want to debate that, that's, that's sort of for a different venue, but the point is what we're actually talking about today by hearing the stories of these different practitioners is kind of pushing the frontier, and as I said last night, kind of creating a new space, creating when they're successful, and I want to get back to Cheryl's wonderful statement last night in just a minute, when it's successful, it's about transformational change, actually creating a landscape that the private sector isn't sort of willing to go into just yet and crowding in wasn't kind of you know, meant to describe that process. In, in my own book, I just tried to describe it as sort of dynamizing in, but it sounds a bit silly. We, we simply don't have the words. And so it'd be really nice if actually as one of the outcomes of today, we actually think up some new words and, and some new terms that actually could also be more useful to for the evaluators of these policies. And this is what I want to sort of focus on now, that there's four key aims, which are actually handily in this uh, policy brief that I wrote for today called Building the Entrepreneurial State, a New Framework for Envisioning and Evaluating, the most important word is evaluating, mission-oriented public investments. And there's sort of four points there. One is, you know, forget the whole picking winners things, directionality. We know that directionality matters. Why? Because as I said last night, innovation doesn't just have a rate, it has a direction. And what we know from looking at the past in different places which have actually achieved this kind of smart innovation-led growth, which we're all discussing here, is that it wasn't enough to just kind of spray the resources around to allow then for certain things like the IT revolution, the nanotech revolution, the biotech revolution, or the clean tech, green tech revolution to happen. These directions were actually kind of chosen. Carlotta's talk last night was very... Uh, bang on on that, she said that, for example, even when you get these technological revolutions, in order for them to get fully deployed throughout the entire economy and to actually have an effect on the productivity and the growth of all sectors, even there you need particular directions to be chosen. She gave the example of suburbanization as an outcome of policy that was meant to actually allow the mass production revolution to get fully deployed. Um, so it's not about do we pick, do we not. All these directions have been picked in the past. It's really how. How does that choosing happen? Um, how can we allow it to also involve lots of experimentation so that maybe you get a broadly defined direction, but within that allow for lots of trial and error experimentation, exploration, which someone like Alfred Hirschman wrote a lot about um, some decades ago when he talked about policy as a, as a learning process. Um, now, that then brings me to the second point, which is evaluation, and I think Cheryl's point was wonderful yesterday. I'm going to probably cite you in everything I write from now on, which is she said, how do we measure success, or f actually failure, in ARPA-E, which again is an organization within the Department of Energy, which is, to put it a bit simplistically, trying to do for the renewable energy space what DARPA did for the internet. Um, she said that they measure failure if, when it's successful, it's not transformative. So um, tell me if I'm right or not, you said, if, you know, if and when we're successful, was that thing that, ca that came out of it transformational in that space? And I think this is really interesting because, again, what you know, Keynes said that the whole point of government was in the end of laissez-faire, 1926, he said the point of government is not just to make things a little bit better or a little bit worse, but to really being doing, uh, do what's not being done at all. And this notion of catalytical transformational change, I hope, will be sort of the cutting, the cross-cutting theme today.
Um, which doesn't mean, obviously, that what the state does is always good. This is not the folkloric view of public policy. This is that that actually should be the ambition, the objective, to be a successful public sector organization to actually nurture that kind of transformation. And hence, our indicators for evaluating these investments should take that on. And again, this is where the whole crowding in, crowding out thing actually is not that useful to even uh, um, you know, measure that kind of... Uh, um, change. Then third point, organizational change. In order to do this stuff, you actually need really innovative organizations. And this, of course, is both in the private and the public sector. Bill Lazonic is one of the most eloquent people I know who talks about organizations because he says um, in lots of his work since, again, decades, um, that you know, what are markets? They're outcomes. They're outcomes of organizational interactions, which organizations, public sector organizations, private sector organizations, and households. Right, households make decisions all the time whether to you know, invest, for example, in education. Um, so seeing markets as outcomes, as opposed to just the boogeyman, allows us also to talk about the private sector in a bit more interesting way. Because you know, even though we know there's all this short-termism, which Haldane talked about last night, again, very uh, interestingly, going back to 50,000 BC. By the way, he did that. Do you know why? Because when I briefed him, I said, now, obviously, Carlotta, who's your discussant, she's a real historian, so that's going to be sort of her contribution. So I think he was like, historian, 50,000 BC. <laughs> anyway, no, he was absolutely phenomenal. But talking about short-termism in the way we often do, I think, lets a lot of companies off the hook. Because, in fact, if you look at any sector, and again, Bill's work has been really important, for this, he's looked, for example, at, at telecommunications, and he, you know, sees companies, some companies like Huawei, number one, Ericsson, number two or three, doing no share buybacks, which, as we mentioned yesterday, is one of the many indicators that one might use to measure the short-termism and the focus just on stock prices, and and others like Cisco doing, you know, more than 100% of what they spend on R&D on share buybacks. So that kind of differentiation of what kind of private sector organizations do we think will be so important in the innovation ecosystem is a crucial question which should be embodied in innovation policy, but also what kind of public sector organizations. We know that the top-down stuff doesn't work. So Fred Block and myself, we've written about this kind of decentralized uh, you know, network state. Um, he calls it the developmental network state, which he wrote also with funding from the Ford Foundation. And we know that this, you know, different types of organizations in places like Silicon Valley, including the ARPA-E's, DARPA's, National Science Foundation, SBIR's, is a bit more effective than, say, just a top-down ministry. But even within these organizations, it's really important what kind of talent you can bring in. And it's kind of hard to bring in that talent if your mission is simply to facilitate this wonderful innovation in the private sector without admitting the sort of you know, revolutionary potential, uh, very innovative role of the public sector, which isn't just de-risking or facilitating, but is a real partner in taking on that risks. And hence, my fourth point, if that's true, we better make sure we have the right systems in place, both taxation and others, to make sure that given that it's taxpayer funded, at least part of this revolutionary investments, which are extremely high risk, of which most will fail, that we not only socialize the risks, but also the rewards. We used to think this would just happen through tax. Uh, don't forget, uh, as, as Giovanni Dozzi often says, that you know, the US actually had a communist president, General Eisenhower, Republican, semi-socialist. Uh, Why? What was the top marginal rate under um, Eisenhower? You know, today we're, we're debating 50p. 90. 90% 90 top marginal income uh, taxation rate under general Republican Eisenhower. So I'm not saying we have to go back to that taxation system, um, but uh, if you actually look at what's happened to, to some taxes like capital gains tax, which used to be 40% in the end of the 1970s, again, both Bill and I have written about this in a paper called Risk and Rewards, it actually fell by 50% in five years. Why? because one particular community was describing itself as the really the innovators, the risk takers, the entrepreneurs, and managed to convince government to you know, reduce that tax in order for them to do their thing. And who was this community? The venture capital community, the Na National Venture Capital Association. Anyway, so I'm gonna stop now, but just to say that I think what would be really interesting to, um, to have a sort of a cross-cutting theme is this debate about directionality as an issue in itself without using the word picking winners. Uh, uh, both Johan Schott, by the way, who's the director of Sprue, and Andy Sterling, who I'm, I'm not sure if he's here yet, but he'll be speaking tomorrow, are actually key people thinking about directionality in this broader way. 
um, evaluation? How do we actually measure the performance of these different types of investments that we're making if we're not just fixing market failures, but actively shaping and creating markets? Organizational change, what kind of organizations, and hopefully we'll be hearing a lot of on the ground stories, do we need in order to make this stuff work? Again, not top-down bureaucrats. Um, and risks and rewards, how do we socialize not just the risks, but also the rewards in a concrete way? Sometimes if we have public venture capital, should it retain equity? What's wrong with that? Um, we know, of course, this does happen in places like Israel. Um, Christian is gonna be telling us today about the Danish Growth Fund. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first session. Tara Alas is gonna be chairing it, and Tara's written a paper for us, by the way, that is in the pack, um, which is incredibly useful because she was also a practitioner in the Business Innovation and Skills Department of Vince Cable, who gave the um, opening speech last night. And Tara is no longer there, but she's a strategic advisor for the government on um, innovation policy in different ways. And it's an amazingly useful paper because it's specifically, you know, from someone who actually worked within government and still is working with government, talks about the limits of that framework for actually talking about this kind of transformational change. Um, anyway, so Tara, you want to come up and introduce, uh, well, everyone who's on the panel come up. There's some free spaces, by the way, in the front here. It says reserved, but lots of the people that it was reserved for are sitting in the back. So feel free to come up if you're standing. <laughs> 